I've got this really sort of interesting here. Oh. <laughs> okay. Performance reviews. For most of us, they're the dreaded times uh, at sometime during the year, whether we're receiving our performance review or for those of us that are managers that we have to give our performance reviews to people. But I wanted to talk to you today about how lawyers receive their performance review. I guess they're kind of spread out like different types of lawyers may get different may get different performance reviews and how that kind of goes for the different roles. Also, I wanted to talk some about how that how that works with judges. So, I mean, for most of us that work in the private sector, like you get a performance review, like maybe on a scale of one to five or whatever, like once a year, your boss tells you what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. And then maybe your your either bonuses or your raises depend on that. So I was just curious. I wanted to talk to you about how that kind of works in the lawyer and the law field and kind of how in some of the cases we're talking about how the people involved would get any performance review of what how they performed and what they would do. So the first case I kind of wanted to talk to you about was the Alec Baldwin case. First of all, have you ever seen a case where like a prosecutor or a lawyer just drops out, quits in the middle of a, a day of a trial? No. And that's, I mean, that is a truly remarkable thing. And it's a testament to how strongly she felt about the, the alleged at the time. And I guess confirmed now error that the state had committed. It's one of those things where, that is always sort of your last resort. And I, and I think it's important to know that. And I think it, it speaks to the seriousness of the whole situation. You don't just willy nilly drop out of a case. You know, you see defense attorneys do it very rarely, really if their client wants to perjure themselves because they can't do that. That's one of the sort of ironclad ethical rules is you cannot suborn perjury. You can't put someone on the stand to lie. And so sometimes defense attorneys will withdraw, but usually the threat is enough. If you say to somebody, look, I feel so strongly about this, that if you move forward with it, I'm going to have to resign or I'm going to have to withdraw. It usually makes the other person think about it. Now, it just sounds like in the Alec Baldwin case, there had been a lot of stuff going on in that case. And she wasn't the first person to drop off that team. But to do it in the middle of the day, the person who gave the opening statement <laughs> to quit a case. Yeah, that is that is dramatic. OK. So let's, I guess, in terms of going back to the performance review, she had a small case, but let's go back to Morrissey is the one, the special prosecutor, as I understand, it's kind of more complicated. She was a special prosecutor just for Alec Baldwin. So I'm not sure kind of what her role was and who she would actually report to, to have any, like, would her, would what she did, kind of the things that she did in that case, get her in trouble of, of anything of a bad performance review or even getting fired, like getting fired from her office or do you have any idea how that would work for her? So in her particular case, it's hard to say, because as you said, she was a special prosecutor, but if you just to, you know, take it bigger, assume for a second that she had just worked for the local DA. I think if she worked for the local DA, there's a strong chance that after something like that happened, she would be asked to leave and, and probably would leave just because that is despite what people think, and sort of, you know, the reputation, I feel like, in true crime of prosecutors, we are not always hiding evidence. <laughs> and it is very rare to have any kind of legitimate claim that you've withheld evidence from the defense. You know, it comes up every now and then, and it, the allegation is made, but usually it's pretty frivolous and easily explained. In that case, you end up having this day-long hearing that concludes with the prosecutor on the stand, which you never want to get to that point, and the judge dismissing the case in this whirlwind Friday, you know, where everything just went crazy. And that is so embarrassing. And you got to remember, most DAs are elected. So typically, assistant district attorneys work for an elected official, and that person is going to have to answer to somebody for the money that was wasted. I mean, let's not forget that. There was a lot of money spent on that trial. They wasted that money for the fact that justice wasn't done. If you assume Ali Baldwin should have been convicted, which if you're bringing a charge against him as the DA, that should be your thought. You're not just doing this for fame and glory. You're doing it because you think there's an issue of justice. And that's a huge thing. It's one thing to put forward your best case and have a jury come back and say not guilty. That happens. That's the system. We want that to happen. 
But for something like this, there would be consequences in the ordinary course because of how it all went down. I mean, I'll say this. I doubt she's ever appointed to be a special prosecutor again, but I don't know that there will be any immediate consequences. Okay. So one of the differences between like me working in the private, or well, some I'll do an analogy is that um, if things get really bad, like in a normal private sector, you would have to go to like HR and then HR would get involved. Um, so, but in terms of the legal field, there is something that's different in your field in that if things are egregious, you can be reported to like bar council. And then if things are that bad, uh, things could, I mean, you could lose your law license uh, to practice law if, as far out. So, I mean, I guess, so for a prosecutor, one of the things that could eventually get you in trouble is, is if you did these Brady violations or, or Giglio violations. Do you know, like, is it like, do you have to do it multiple times? Can you get in trouble once and then get reported to counsel? Do you think, do you think Morrissey is going to be reported to bar counsel for that? So that's a good question. I'll say this, you know, you're talking about HR and sort of comparing it to people in private sector. The bar is the sort of ultimate arbiter, right? But they're all, they're, they're pretty removed. And the times where you're actually going to have any kind of interaction with the bar are pretty slim. And, and you got to remember, there are different kinds of lawyers. So if you're in the private practice working for yourself, all you have is your reputation and then the bar. And like you said, if you do something, you, you break a rule, you mess with your client's money, which is what gets most lawyers disbarred, then you're going to be reported to the bar by your client or by a judge. Getting reported by a judge is really bad <laughs> or or another counsel. And then you have to go to, you know, almost like a, a court where you can argue your case and then you may be removed. But one thing I think is for people out there who are wondering how this is structured, for most prosecutors, for most defense attorneys, they actually do have sort of an HR. So if you're, for instance, a public defender or a federal defender in the federal system, you're part of an organization just like prosecutors are. And there are people who review your performance, see whether or not you're doing a good job for your clients. Are you working hard? Are you digging into the cases? Are you producing the evidence? And if you're not, you know, you can be fired by them and you, you're still a lawyer you're still an attorney, but you can lose your job. Same thing. Most prosecutors offices, we talked about district districts, attorneys, districts, attorney, district attorneys. I'm not sure which, which way it goes. Anyways, <laughs> we talked about them. They're the elected officials. They're your state prosecutors. Then you have federal prosecutors called U.S. attorneys and assistant United States attorneys work for them. They all work for the Department of Justice. And there are all sorts of levels of review in ways that you can get in trouble for doing things like not producing evidence. That is a big deal. The Department of Justice takes that very seriously. And if there are lawyers who are being sanctioned for that, and a dismissal of a case in the federal system like that, you would have to report. You'd have to report that up the chain. And you might get looked into by, you know, the public affairs people, essentially, who want to make sure that the prosecutors are all doing their job. And in addition to that, like you said, you could also be reported to the bar. How many does it take? I'll say this. It is fairly rare for attorneys to be disbarred for something that happens in court. Unless it's really egregious, unless it's really egregious, just because there's sort of this feeling of, you know, it's you're in the middle of the fight and all this other stuff. So in this case, I think they made an error in not turning that stuff over, but I don't think it was, you know, they, they weren't telling the police to destroy evidence. They weren't, I think in their mind, this wasn't important. It wasn't relevant. And since it's not relevant and important and material, what's the point of turning it over to the defense? And when the judge did that whole hearing, she determined actually it was material. It was relevant. It was something the defense could have used to build their case. And so she sort of said, you're wrong about that. And, and we talk about this when we talk about discovery all the time. One of the rules is always, if you're in a room with a bunch of other prosecutors and you're arguing over whether or not something is discoverable and you feel you feel like you're right, but it's a close case, you need to turn that over because you don't want to have that fight later on. You don't want to have, to have some judge making that decision unless it's clearly not discoverable. Err on the side of turning it over. And that's what they should have done here. But I don't think it was malicious. I don't think it's the kind of thing that would get you disbarred. Like I said, usually 
if you're going to get disbarred, it's money that does it. It's you got client funds that you're spending or mixing with your own money, money stuff. Money stuff is going to get you disbarred as a lawyer far more often than things like constitutional violations, whether that's the way it should be or not. Yeah, I think there was a Maryland uh, attorney that was horribly egregious. Like, I think I, re I like where it was like 100 Brady violations and something like that, something big. And they finally got rid of them. And a lot, I mean, when that happens, then every single case that he ever prosecuted kind of gets questioned. So, yeah, you're right. I, that's what I heard. It takes a lot from the prosecution. But I guess but sw switching it kind of to a different case that we followed a long time ago that had some news this week was uh, Mosby uh, was in the news a little bit this week. Um, as you know, she was the one that uh, helped get Adnan out of prison for the motion to vacate and later said he was kind of innocent and would, that's been ongoing. But because she got um, she was charged and convicted of a felony for perjury. That that is one of the things that you could actually lose your law license over for it too. So I understand what the process is. What happened was that it, that I'm not quite sure is that she got reported to the Supreme Court of Maryland, and they had asked her, "Hey, we want to disbar her. Can we do this quickly and get it over with?" She said, "No, I want to fight it." So the Supreme Court of Maryland said, "No, you you have a chance to have a hearing. We're gonna have a hearing, and then we'll come back to us and we'll make the decision on what happens." So. So it, I guess it's very interesting that people don't know and probably is that the Supreme Court of the of of a state is the one responsible for a lot of these interactions with the attorneys. So like don't like when you pass the bar, you get a ceremony in front of the Supreme Court. And if you like and a lot of the things that the Supreme Court do, if it does, if you look at all the the announcements, they'll announce, oh, this Fred was disbarred or Fred had his license suspended for six months. And so kind of the Supreme Court is over the bar council is kind of over the bar council. Yeah. And essentially you got to remember, we're talking about the right to work, you know, to be able to practice law. And in many ways, the bar is a monopoly. It's a state sanctioned monopoly. It's a guild. It's anti-competitive. It's, it's a walking, talking antitrust violation, right? <laughs> so one way you sort of get around that is it's connected to the state Supreme Court, like you said. So when you become admitted to the bar, you know, that is the Supreme Court is taking part in that. And your due process protection is essentially you can't be removed without the ability to have some sort of review. So you can always challenge that and the Supreme Court's the ultimate arbiter. Now, usually you agree to be disbarred. So that's one of those things. It's like everything else. It's kind of looked upon favorably. If a few years later you want to come back and reapply and you want to say, Hey, I did that terrible thing, but I agreed with you at the time to be disbarred, but I've kept my nose clean. I'm a great citizen. I want to practice law again. Allow me to do that. And you see that a lot. People often get disbarred for breaking the law for being convicted of crimes. Not that surprising. Um, but they often come back and, and we see that a lot. You'll see somebody get disbarred. And then a few years later, all of a sudden they're appearing on the docket again. You're like, Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> they got their, their license back. Mosby is in a particularly precarious position because number one, she was in a position of trust. She wasn't just a lawyer. She was the state's attorney for Baltimore, the city attorney, whatever they, however they term it there. And she was convicted of perjury, which is, a crime of sort of moral turpitude. It goes to your honesty and your integrity and all this other stuff. And, and we just view those crimes for lawyers uh, more, the, more harshly because it makes you wonder, can we trust this person to stand up in court and represent their client or represent the state or represent whatever in a truthful way, a way that we can trust. And so I wonder if she's fighting it because of that, because she figures because of the reason she would be disbarred, it would be really hard to ever get her license back. Now, is she likely to succeed? I would think not. I mean, she was convicted. Frankly, she should be on her knees thanking the Lord for the sentence that she got because she didn't have to go to prison. And, uh, you know, that was, that was pretty good given what she was accused of. So, you know, maybe, maybe just take this one instead of fighting it. But I guess she's going to, He's going to try and convince the Supreme Court she should be able to continue to practice law, and we'll see. Okay, yeah. 
Uh, now let's turn our attention to judges. Can you tell me what like what are the ways that judges can be removed? So that's really fascinating and depends on the judge, right? So let's start with the hardest judges to remove, federal judges who receive life tenure, appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. Once you, have, once you receive life tenure, the only way you can be removed really is through impeachment by the Senate. And that's a very rare thing. And usually, and so in a lot of ways, once you're a federal judge, man, unless you just go crazy, you are going to be, you're going to remain in office. There have been some interesting things that have happened. Like there was one judge and I can't remember where he was, but I think everyone agreed that he was like 90 years old and everybody thought he has, he has Alzheimer's or he has dementia, but he wouldn't step down. And the judges kind of met and they basically, they took all his cases away. So he was still a judge, but he had no cases. Like all the judges met together and took his cases away. And there was a really interesting question about whether or not they could do that because he is a judge. Can you actually, but you know, at the end of the day, everybody's like, well, look, man, still got his job. He's still getting paid. He just can't do cases. Not like he has a right to cases, right? So that's what happens. Now, you have seen it happen a couple of times. It happened once in my state uh, where I practice law. We had a federal judge who got into a domestic situation, was arrested uh, for domestic violence. And the way it worked is essentially the judicial counsel for the circuit. So... Uh, I don't know who all knows this, but the federal system is divided into circuits. So you might have heard of the Ninth Circuit. Yeah. It's out in California. And the First Circuit is Maine, right? So anyways, the circuit council that covered Florida, Georgia, and Alabama came together and recommended or, or told him, actually, they were going to recommend he be impeached. So he actually resigned. So he resigned his position. So that's the way it works in the federal system. It is very hard to get rid of a judge in the federal system. You really have to do a lot. And it's just it's just incredibly rare. The states are all different, but a lot of them have sort of a judicial inquiry commission, the JIC, it's often called. And they receive complaints just like the bar does. And, and if you're a judge or if you're a prosecutor or you're a defense attorney, you're going to have complaints against you. People are going to be upset. And so they review those and they actually can remove judges from the bench once again. We had this happen in Alabama where we had a, a guy who was chief justice of the Supreme Court. His name is Roy Moore. He ran for Senate at one point and became sort of nationally famous. But he was chief justice of the Supreme Court, and he put a monument to the Ten Commandments in the Supreme Court building. It's a big stone monument. And not surprisingly, the state was sued by the ACLU and some other organizations, religious you know, freedom from religion type organizations. And a federal judge said, yeah, you have to remove that. That's a violation of separation of church and state. You have to remove that. And he said, no, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Is it not going to remove yeah. it? I'm going to defy this judge's order. So he gets a complaint against him to the judicial inquiry committee. And they have like a little trial basically where they present all the reasons that he should be removed because he was defying a lawful order and he was eventually removed from being chief justice. And then he ran again and won. So, <laughs> so he was back and then he actually got removed again. So, you know, <laughs> I guess that's the way it goes sometimes, but different places are different ways. You know, if you have like a city judge, they might be, could be fired for various malfeasance and you just see it every now and then. Sometimes you have recall elections. There was that judge, I forget, if it was in California or Washington, but you had the, the guy who was a swimmer who raped the girl and the judge didn't give him anything, gave him like six months oh, yeah. probation. Yeah. You remember that? Talked about like, oh, he's got such a bright future and all this other stuff. Well, obviously the community was outraged and I believe he was actually recalled, which is you have a vote that essentially says, you're not going to be a judge anymore. We're going to recall you and you're done. So there are various ways you can do it, but just... There are no, even the federal system, there's a way to do it. It's just really hard. Okay. I, all I know is that like when I, when I get my ballot or vote coming up in November, there's a section that says, do you wish to retain the appellate judge Frank or Fred Flintstone? And you're like, uh, state elections, 
State elections for judges are all over the place. You have retention elections, apparently, in your state, which is exactly that. The the judge doesn't run for re-election. You vote whether or not to retain him. And if you don't retain him, then that seat can be filled by somebody else. Other places, like in Alabama, we have partisan elections. So judges run as, as Republicans and Democrats, and then when their term's up, they have to run again. So it is different depending on where you are. Okay, because one of the things that has been hinted at, I don't know if it's true, is that um, one of the reasons that uh, Adnan's decision might be postponed and might be really delayed is because three of the justices are up for re-election um, in November. So I have a couple of friends, or at least one friend that says maybe that they're trying to make the decision not be a political and not be sent out. I don't know if there's any truth to that, but that is one of the things because there is three judges that are gonna up for re-election. And look, I mean, that wouldn't shock me. It wouldn't surprise me if that's the case. That decision has taken a lot longer than I think any of us thought it was going to take. And at this point, it's only a couple more months. So, you know, do you want to drop an October surprise and see what happens? And I don't know. I don't know what the politics is of the Adnan case in, in Maryland. Yeah. Okay. Let's switch kind of the gears. Um, I think we talked a little bit about public defenders. But what happens in the cases, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, in the case like in Delphi, where Rosie and Baldwin are, are private attorneys, but they've been, are they are they private, but they're also public defender, like in this, where states use private defender, private lawyers to do public defense when they don't have enough, when they don't have enough public defenders. So as I understand it, sometimes they'll use private, private lawyers to do it. So do they get reviewed? What have, or does the does the state say, well, we don't like your firm anymore? Like, how does that kind of go? Do you know anything about that? So they can, and it depends on the exact setup. So I'm not entirely sure how it works in Indiana, but I'll tell you how it works here. There are some attorneys have a contract with the city. So, you know, imagine you have a city, you may have a public defender's office, but here's one problem that comes up. You have a public defender's office and you have five guys who were charged with conspiracy. Well, that public defender's office can't really represent all five of those guys, particularly if one of them wants to testify against the other four, because there'd be a conflict, right? So even places with a public defender have to have some sort of ability to bring in outside lawyers to represent in indigent clients in situations like that. So oftentimes you'll either have lawyers who have contracts with the city and essentially it'll say 50% of my time is I'm a private lawyer. I can do whatever I want. But I have to I have to defecate. I have to dedicate fifty percent of my time to representing indigent clients in your city, and that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is something called a panel, where you'll have private attorneys who apply to be a part of this panel, and panel attorneys are assigned just like public defenders to represent clients, and it can be a good way to. I mean, if you're a private attorney you know, there's a lot of hustling you have to do to get clients, right? I mean, it's sometimes you've got a ton of work coming through the door and sometimes you don't. If you can get one of those panel assignments and you've always got work. And so that you never have to worry about not being able to pay the bills because you're always going to have that. And then you have your own clients on the side and maybe that's where you can kind of make the big bucks. But, and those panel positions can be pretty coveted. And if you have an attorney who's being complained about, an attorney who has been found ineffective a lot because that happens a lot too. There's no real negative consequence to being found ineffective in an ineffective assistance of counsel claim. You know, you're not going to be disbarred for that. But one thing that can happen is if it's happening over and over and over again, and you're one of those panel attorneys, your position, you can lose that position. So I would imagine if in Indiana, Baldwin and Rossi, depending on how exactly it works, I can imagine there would be some judges who would say, look, we don't want these guys on the panel anymore. We don't want these guys representing indigent clients anymore. We saw how they acted. It's just not, it's not something we want. And it's not like you have a right to do that. So I could, I could definitely foresee that in the future, they will be representing whatever clients want to hire them, but they may not get many appointments. Okay. But there is also one other difference that defense lawyers have that's different is that they can, they can be sued for malpractice by the client. So, I mean, so if that, I mean, there, that is one mechanism that allows you to go directly after them. They won't lose their, their license, but if they lose, I mean, so their insurance will pay out 
for like if they said, well, if some client says you owe me a million dollars for your bad because you were bad defending me and they win that malpractice suit, the insurance pays it out. But at the same, that lawyer would have his malpractice premiums is go up. I mean, it's kind of like a doc. I mean, it's the same thing as a doctor where like malpractice and a doctor where they lit, it would go to court. And if they win, they get money. And you'd be surprised how many attorneys, like I know some defense attorneys who were private defense attorneys who have gone to defenders offices because they were tired of things like that, like having to pay for malpractice insurance is very hard to find. It is incredibly expensive. It's, it's actually a pretty big problem in the legal field these days because you're right. I mean, people are getting sued all the time, right? You know, I mean, if you're, it's kind of like if you're a client and you lose the case, what, who are you going to blame? Usually you don't blame yourself. <laughs> Usually you blame your lawyer. That's why you see all the ineffective assistance counsel claims. And that's why you can see those lawsuits. So a lot of times it's better to be in an organization because they handle all that. And you don't have to worry about it personally. So that you're 100% right about that. That is a big issue. Okay. Well, let's see. What are, I'm, like, I'm trying to think of all the other big cases, I guess. So I guess for right now, the performance review in the Karen Reed trial is that uh, Lally is going to his DA, as we've talked about earlier, with Morrissey, and they're going to be discussing what they did right and wrong about that case and then what they're going to do forward. So I guess let's, can we, I, I kind of jumping ahead, but what do you expect on Monday? I don't think Monday is going to be anything important, as I understand it. Uh, I think they just have, all I understand is a pretrial hearing to set the court, kind of the court timeline. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think basically, usually pretrial hearings are pretty innocuous. It's what are some dates that work for you? How long do you think it's going to take this time? Is there any chance we could work this out? Are there any sort of pending motions that need to be decided? Really just informing the court of how long it's going to take and what's going to be needed. And I think in that case, my understanding is that the presiding judge isn't even going to handle this, this hearing, which is just not that surprising. I mean, some people wondered if that signaled that she might not be the judge and who knows? I mean, she might not, she might decide she doesn't want to do it again, or she might get a motion to recuse from one of the parties, but I don't see anything about that being significant just because it's fairly common for these routine pretrial conferences to be handled that way. At some point in that case, so they have to try it, I believe, within a year. I think that's the rule in Massachusetts, assuming that both parties don't agree to continue it. And I don't imagine why you would want to continue it past a year. But they'll decide on a hearing date. And at some point, the Commonwealth is going to have to have that conversation you just talked about, that tough conversation, and decide whether they want to retry all the counts or not. It's not as if they're obligated to do so. They can dismiss counts or they can go forward on all of them. This is assuming the motion to dismiss comes to nothing, which I think it probably will. Um, I think there's a really good argument for dropping the second degree murder charge in that case. You've had a hung jury. We still don't know the exact breakout, but it would not surprise me if there weren't a lot of people voting to convict on second degree murder just because of the facts of the case. And if you're looking at trying it again, it's one thing to try a case twice. If you hang again, then it becomes really questionable whether or not you want to move forward. And we've seen cases, everybody knows the cases where they tried six, seven, eight times. I don't think that's going to happen here. And I think the best way to avoid that is to simplify your case, strengthen your case, focus your case, and that may mean that that second degree murder charge, which my understanding, you know, was sort of came at grand jury, wasn't even necessarily going to be something they were going to pursue. I think something they should consider yeah. dropping. So I had another question about that. I guess I had heard something and I was wondering if it's true. And like in Massachusetts, I don't know if it's like judges switch. Well, judges sometimes switch which law they cover. It sounded like somebody had told me in a note where they sometimes do family law and then some maybe civil and then criminal and maybe that uh judge beverly is or bev is like switching back to civil i don't know if that's ever do judges ever switch or do they or do they stick with whatever and they're always stuck with it you know that's totally dependent on where you are and how it's structured you have a lot of judges who handle everything you handle everything from 
misdemeanors, traffic tickets, all the way up to murder cases, depending on your jurisdiction. Then you have judges who are very specialized, like you were saying. You have family law judges, family court judges, drug court judges who who really deal with low level drug crimes are very successful in a lot of jurisdictions then you have judges who only handle criminal cases and judges that only handle civil cases most judges handle both most judges are sort of divided into tiers you might have depending on where you are circuit judges versus district judges and circuit judges might handle the big felonies and the big lawsuits over a certain amount of money and then district judges might handle the misdemeanors and sort of the lower level small claims court type things. I mean, that is every state. The, the, this this country is a beautiful place. It's a tapestry <laughs> when it comes to the law. And every jurisdiction is completely different about how they do just about everything. So it's always fun to learn. And, and one of the things I like about following these cases is you just see. It's like in South Carolina, the Murdoch case, where the judge picks the foreman. Who knew? Right. It's just different, different places do things differently. Uh, other question I had about judges is do they, do the judges like in that court system, do they talk between the trials or do they discuss the legal issues? Like, do they get help and, or do they get feedback from their, their peers that say, maybe you should have allowed that in or, or not and keep it quiet. Do you know how that works? Does it? Oh, I think they absolutely do. You know, it's, and that's one of those things where, different jurisdictions and, and you see this where you know in where i work in the federal courts things like ex parte contact so one party and the judge are just very rare the judges don't like it the lawyers don't do it it's just frowned upon but then across the street like in the state courts ex parte conversations happen all the time the judges will tell prosecutors you know what you really need to drop that one count and reach some sort of plea agreement with this guy because you're going to lose. Like, yeah, that stuff happened. So it just depends on the culture of the court. I, there are lots of judges who like to reach out to their colleagues on tough questions. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, as long as they're making their own decisions, not doing what their colleagues tell them to do. Now, how critical are they of each other to their face? Probably not that critical. Like I doubt, I doubt any judges are coming up to her and saying, you really should have let that one piece of evidence in or whatever. But do I think she has talked a lot with the other judges about the case? Absolutely. Because I think that also happens kind of at the Supreme Court, too, where, I mean, you always hear, even though, like, Scalia was, like, the opposite of Ginsburg, they would always talk, like, they were good friends outside of, or I don't know if it was that one, but they're, they're good friends outside of court, even though their decisions are always the opposite. Except for, I mean, so it's always interesting. And it's a lot different when you have a nine-panel or a three-panel judge because they're 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 talking they're horse trading that i mean they make their decision like early on and then they write the papers and then they change or discuss it i mean that's why i guess i'm really confused to what's taking the ad on decision so long it's we're approaching a year and people have tried to say that it's because like like i mean that is a split decision but courts have split decisions all the time and don't take all the time. time so i mean if it's four three it's four three yeah, I mean, look, a year is a really long time to wait on a decision. And, you know, we had a case recently in my office where we argued it. One of the other lawyers argued it. Um, did a great job, but we knew we were going to lose. <laughs> we just knew we were going to lose. We walked out the door and a year passed and we had still not gotten a decision. And I remember saying it's because the one judge that we thought we might get is going is writing like a hundred page dissent. We're gonna get this opinion, and it's gonna be it's gonna be 110 pages, and 100 pages will be the dissent, and that's exactly what it was. We got it back, and it was just this incredibly long dissent, and that must have taken a really long time to do. So I think it's either, and I think more likely to be what you said that this is there might be some politics preventing this from moving quickly. Because here's the thing: that case I was just talking about was a run of the mill, not important case. Not the kind of case you prioritize. This case, given the attention and everything else, the long history, you would think is the kind of case you would prioritize. And the fact of the matter is, most of those, I think there are seven, there are seven justices. I think on that one, yeah. Um, most of them knew what they were going to do, maybe all of them, before they walked in there for oral argument. 
they certainly knew what they were going to do by the time they walked out. They had conference immediately afterwards, which is where the judges all meet in a room and basically sort of take a vote and very briefly say why they think they're going to do what they're going to do. Someone would have been assigned the majority. That majority would have been written and then circulated to all the justices, including the dissenters. The dissenters, based on that, and they probably already would have started writing their dissent, but they would sort of tailor some of it to the majority. You see this in Supreme Court opinions all the time. And then the majority probably would write some responses in, you know, as our as our friends in dissent say X, Y, and Z, well, here's the reason they're wrong. You'll see that sometimes too. So there is some back and forth, and that does take some time. But this is a long time. I mean, almost a year oh, yeah. is a is a long time. Now, look, if you told me, oh no, all their cases are like that, you know, they routinely take a year to release an opinion. Okay, you know, different courts move at different speeds, but this feels certainly feels like a long time for a question that frankly, no matter which side you come out on, isn't that complicated. You know, I mean, you're either going to affirm the circuit court for basically the reasons they gave, or you're going to say something along the lines of this just isn't proper for review. And well, I think that the possibility, I think the problem is that there's some underlying issues that they're trying to work through that they want to fix, but it wasn't part of the, really part of the case. So I think that's kind of a big problem. And I'm trying to, sometimes they there might was speculation be to... that the legislature might do something. I don't know if that's sure or not that like they might tweak that statute. And so maybe they were waiting on that. I don't know. It's crazy. Um, one other issue like that came up this week too. And I wanted to get your opinion on was the, um, was the appeal to get judge goal kicked off the case. So can you explain what happened there? And is this normal? And, how did like it's a weird appeal? It is. And you know, as I've said before, civilization only works with civilized people. So you have in Indiana this provision that allows you to essentially move to have a judge removed if they're not doing their job. You know, you've got a civil case, it's been pending for 10 years, you got motions that you filed two years ago, and they've never ruled on it. And this happens a lot, and it drives lawyers crazy. And you don't, there's not much you can do. I mean, you can call the judge and ask for a conference or you can file a status motion. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the judge moves as fast as the judge wants to move. Well, in Indiana, they have a provision that is meant to allow you to do something to take the decision away from that judge and say, look, this person is, they're just not doing their job. They call it a lazy judge motion. motion. They're just not doing their job. Can you give this to some judge who's actually going to rule on the things that we presented? And of course, you know, this is something that you should use rarely with a lot of thought and circumspection for all sorts of reasons. It should be obvious to everyone. But the Delphi lawyers, rather than do that, just went ahead and filed one for like their third and fourth Frank's motion, which that should already be a red flag for you that they have filed four Frank's motions, which ordinarily you would have one of. And then when that one was denied, then you have your appeal issue preserved and you just move forward. But the, this defense team likes to file these repetitive motions where just like one after another, they have moved on multiple occasions to have Judge Goal removed. This is just the latest of those. So they filed this and it was pretty clear just from looking at the statute that because it was a repetitive motion, because it was duplicative, the third Frank's motion, the fourth Frank's motion, that the rule didn't apply to it. And that's eventually what the Supreme Court said. They said, yeah, they've been pending more than 30 days, but they're repetitive motions. So the rule doesn't apply and they did not remove her. And it just goes to uh, an issue I think a lot of people have had with this case. We're now, once again, rapidly approaching trial. The speedy trial, there's a speedy trial motion filed by the defense that set the trial for May. None of us thought the defense would be ready to go in May. They, in fact, were not ready to go in May and moved for a continuance. I think it was continued to October, which in May seemed like a long way away, right? <laughs> like, but it's not that far anymore. Now we're almost at the end of July. And instead of preparing for what's going to be a very difficult case, they're all filing these motions, trying to remove the judge, which, by the way, if they had removed the judge, do you think there would have been a trial in October? If they'd had to replace her with someone else? Probably mm -hmm. not. That would have delayed the case again. And I think if you're just out there curious about the case and following it at a distance, you can ask yourself, why is the defense so willing 
to delay a trial when their client is already being held in custody. And in fact, is in a prison, being held in a prison. And I think that says something about how they view their case. I don't know what they're waiting to happen. I don't know what they think the delays will accomplish, but I'm very hopeful that this trial happens in October. But the, when they filed that motion, it made me think, here we go again. They're not going to be ready in October either. Well, I guess we can all the way do it. And I guess, I mean, I think Koberger has been pushed out till like 2025. That's another big case, but that one's been silent. And I think both sides have been kind of uh, good on that one. I think the only one on that one was the, whether or not they could pull uh, the citizens of that County about specific issues and whether that would taint the, the jury pool or not. Yeah. And I still think that one's going to, I think that feels like a case I've said it was going to go to trial because I think Koberger is a narcissist and wants to be at the center of things. But the way they're handling that case kind of feels like a case that's going to plea. I mean, they, nobody seems not, they're not rushing anything. They're not fighting, you know, each other very hard. Like you said, they did that one thing about pulling the jury, but that's about it. I kind of feel like that one may end up pleading out. Yeah. Um, well, that's why we're here on this roller coaster of all these uh, different court cases. So um, I think that's about all the questions that I had. I uh, just wanted to thank you very much for taking the time on the Saturday afternoon to talk to me and, and go over this. And I'm, I'm, hopefully people are interested in how lawyers kind of, how they get feedback, how judges get feedback, how they can get fired uh, for not. I mean, I think there's a lot, every, the Rosin Bra, or, uh, uh, whatever or like i think half of them want them fired half of them are they're gods so exactly like, so okay well thank you well, mike you're the best I always enjoy it can you hang out for one second absolutely sorry